what's up? Welcome to Audio Tree Live. It is March 28th, 2024, and I'm your host, Fingy. Before we get into today's session, I urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, stay in the loop with all the amazing music we have going on in the still. And with that, everything you see on our YouTube channel is on all streaming services, Apple, Spotify, Tidal, Amazon, you name it, we're there, tap in on the go. But with that being said, I am so stoked to introduce, we got our sonically explosive pop extraordinaire, Discovery Zone. Take it away, my friend.
Discovery Zone. Hell yeah. I I uh I realized upon these past three songs are a couple things that I am desperately in need of. One is a pair of super awesome sunglasses like yourself. Where'd you get those guys? She got these in a little town called Los Angeles. California, baby. You got it. Ew. Can I can I ask what area? As a native myself. Oh, I don't even know. Uh, it was actually when I toured with you and we played. What, what was the venue we played in? LA? I believe we played the Lodge Room when we opened for Jenny Hall. And yeah. there was a Love. there was a cute little uh, thrift store around the corner. Nice. And these things just spoke to me. Uh, I like it. I like it a lot. I like the slim look. Because I live in a. I live up in uh, Canada, and it's a lot of gray skies. Uh, Not much sunlight, so I gotta, I gotta bring the yellow into my yeah in, into my discovery zone. Yeah, and then you adjust, and then the whole world just brightens up. You're also reading like a guys. like a teeny tiny book outside. Yeah, try this guy's on. You're reading like such a tiny book. And it's tiny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude, I it, I maybe you maybe got the, the large hands, but like, dude, it, it, the teen time book, you got those teen time sunglasses. And then I learned that you're getting a PhD, and I'm like, this tracks, honestly. Oh, yeah. cool. You got the whole track. Also, I uh, I gotta I gotta tap in on a theremin, bro. Like, I've only I've I played one before, and it looked ancient. We were joking in the control room. That's like straight from 2040. What's the situation yeah, with that guy? This is from the future. It's uh, it hasn't been invented yet, but right. you can see it now due to a little loophole in the space-time continuum that yeah. I won't go into any further, but it is uh, a theremini, so it's a digital theremin. Okay. Yeah, it's it's basically like a synthesizer. Okay. So that Moog makes them, and uh, yeah, you can program your different presets, you know, you can mess with the, the waveform and all that stuff, and you can put it in a key. So they're kind of like theremins for beginners. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Because I was like, is that chromatic? Because the way you, like, every note was perfectly hit. I'm like, your muscle yeah. memory must be crazy. I put some kind of, like, auto-tune on it. So I kind right. of like it to Just use say it it's as muscle memory, like a, JJ. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> Just say it's muscle memory. It is, yeah, it is. You it's, can do it uh, in your sleep. Dave is actually controlling it with his mind. That's a whole other story, though. <laughs> that we can get into. Which, yeah. honestly, we will. Because, like I've been saying, I've had many a questions. And I have to start by... Locking in on my notes here because your new project, Quantum Web, which you can see right here. We got the limited edition. So sorry about it. I don't know if you'll be able to cop it, but I just did. And I think you should, too, if you can, if you have the in. Uh, but the more I was reading the bio of the project, the less I was understanding it, which is why I <laughs> that's, wanted that's to. That's intentional. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I clocked that. So I'm going to read it out for the viewers, and then we're, we have some unpacking we got to do. Quantum Web came out in March and was, quote, inspired by the omnipresence of advertising and corporate culture as much as the potential of cybernetics and neural networks, where the distinctions between the earnest and the ironic blur in tandem with the border between the human and the post-human. Part of me is like, that's Apple dictation. Well, uh, just for legal purposes, I have to state I did not write that. Right. I don't. I'm not exactly sure who did, but a real person did. Someone sat down, smoked a nice doobie, and was like, I get it. Yeah. But, but genuinely, I know there is so much truth behind this. And, okay, to start, human and post-human, what's your, what's your connection to that? Because I know you've talked about a normalized society before, and I don't know if that plays hand in hand. What have I talked about before? Uh... A hyper-normalized oh, version right. of reality. Right. So right. actually, this is this is good. This is like a PhD Dr. Dave territory right here because um, I'll just I'll start from a completely different point than your question. But Sorry. Dave and I met in an airport um, many years ago. He was he was handling baggage, wearing a wearing the visi vest, and oh. um, I just noticed the way in which he was handling the baggage was so tender and mm. careful. And I said, you know. Tiny book. Yeah, he that's what I was saying. Just yeah, like handle the tiny books. And I, you know, I just I, I asked him, you know, if he wanted to, you know, just to have a chat, and we got into it, and you know, later found out he plays saxophone, and the, the whole story unfolded. But actually, um, we found out we could communicate telepathically. So mm -hmm. during COVID, when we were on different continents, I was living in Berlin, he was in Vancouver. We were communicating at some points, just talking about you know different books we were reading, and he actually introduced me to a book by N. Catherine Hales called oh, yeah. um, 
um, how I became post-human. And that really kind of opened my mind to this whole kind of discourse about the human and the post-human and um, getting into sort of like immaterial reality and how we're sort of transitioning out of material reality into mm -hmm. the cyber realm and all these technologies. But that in fact, um, it is very important to stay embodied. And so I think there's like, there's theorists kind of like Ray Kurzweil or something like that that are really into like transhumanism. They're like, we're gonna merge with technology and we're gonna become this like, post-human society in this kind of corporate way that's sort of like self-optimization. And I sort of realized like, oh, okay, that's not actually what I believe in or, or that I'm into. I'm sort of more into asking these questions, like what is human or what is post-human and how do we sort of navigate that in a sort of, you know, late stage capitalism way where technology is amazing and has infinite potential, but it's just a force. So right. when it's guided by the sort of you know, ghoulish hands of capitalism, it can result mm. in this kind of like commodified, um, humanoid, um, cyborg, sort of like, we're all products now and we're all optimized and that kind of thing. So yeah, I kind of tend to be more like critical of that perspective and sort of, a, I'm trying it myself actually to become and remain more embodied in this reality and mm. um, have actual connections with people. But yeah, I mean, Dr. Dave probably has a thing or two to chime into about that. Yeah. I dare say. Yeah, but you don't want to. I do. I don't I, know much, how much time we have. I mean, to be I think real, we, got we have. Other questions. We got like we got like a good fifteen twenty to chop it. I would I would love to hear your perspective on that. Sure. That whole thing. On the perspective of the of the post human and cybernetics and yeah. our, and and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm similar to JJ. I'm kind of uh, interested in cybernetics. I mean, critical of. Uh, oh yeah. I'm, I'm definitely not like a, a utopian, like a cyber utopian kind of like believing that there's like cybernetic technologies are expanding uh, human consciousness and connecting it because I think that there's a fallacy at the, the, at the basis of like the cybernetic uh, theoretical framework. Mm -hmm. Because cybernetic systems, automated systems, artificial intelligence, these things, they process information, but they don't metabolize meaning. Mm. I'm going to say that. Right. And uh, there's something about uh, like an interiority and a purposiveness that, can, that can't be uh, manufactured and uh, in kind of cybernetic technologies. So yeah, I think that there's a, there's a lot of um, ways that we're connected through information processing networks, but that they actually reduce our attention to and our ability to metabolize meaningful uh, patterns and relationships. So. And when you say metabolized meaning, yeah. is is that are we capable of doing that due to our connection between like the mind, the mind, the body, the spirit, emotion in a way that like code can't? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like why why can't AI metabolize meaning in the way we can? Because I was I was watching like Diary of CEO and Will I Am was talking about how he was making this like new AI interface. So it's essentially like trying to protect our personal rights, like the rights to our face, the right to our, our voice, yeah. et cetera. But he was also talking about how in like 10 years, he's like, oh, my job as a musician is going to be completely kaput because I make music on the computer. And in 10 years, AI is, AI is going to be able to do that just as efficiently, if not more efficiently than I can. And well, I am music, just like so many other electronic musicians, like there's so much meaning that has to be derived from the human conscious to be then output into whatever... Uh, artistic output, so music in the sense, and then out into the sonic realm. So do you agree or disagree that AI will be able to generate meaning, meaning yeah, yeah. in a way that humans can? I think, I think not, maybe not meaning, but I, I think that AI is sort of like a, a hyper mirror. So it's like a multi-dimensional mirror that can reflect back like a, a sort of like a, a, a hyperspace of what like humans are and what we do, but mm -hmm. uh, and the, the mental kind of the ecology of mind, Gregory Bateson term. Uh, but there's a there's a, I'll, I'll, I'll reference a guy called Hans Jonas since we're getting kind of uh, theoretical, theoretical here. Hans Jonas is a cool uh, f a philosopher of kind of technology, phenomenological existentialist, and he he wrote a, uh, an essay in 1966 called uh, "Critique of Cybernetics" or something like that, and he basically was in, in the 60s, he was critiquing like the cybernetic sort of self-regulating model, uh, which was at that time, you know, thermostats, but mostly like guided missiles, mm -hmm. and being like, 
there's basically a type of autonomy that let's just say the let's just say that the kind of meaning that uh, I'm taught that is like the foundational meaning in an individual's life is the meaningful distinction between self and world, mm. and that boundary is not something you can manufacture. And so any cybernetic technology is always actually tethered to an emergent sort of self-world distinction mm -hmm. that is experiential and mm -hmm. can't be like reproduced. Mm -hmm. um, so AI is much more complex now than guided missiles. At the time, he was like, you know, guided missiles are always, they can be given a set of parameters and a, and a, and a sort of a self-regulating uh, network within a certain context, but they're always given that, they're always described that context mm -hmm. uh, for meaning making or information processing by an organically emergent self-world distinction, which mm. is like the meaning of like an existential meaning um, of the like or organic life has. And so I think now you get much more complex versions of these cybernetic systems and self-regulating networks, but they're always tethered to the kind of like self-world distinction, which is the, the ground of meaning that we all feel. That's like what it feels like to, to be alive kind of, I think, that is always going to be uh, a source of a necessary source for like AI and cybernetic technologies to to be kind of like finally fundamentally tied down to. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah. So there's a sense of autonomy won't like. But then we are anyway. Go on about that. But but then you could kind of look at the dystopian like Matrix version of that, where like sure they need us the way that like they needed bat humans as batteries in the Matrix. But there's a way that like the system can re reproduce itself such that we're just kind of like relegated to just that one sort of role mm -hmm. and all other information processing is like automated mm -hmm. beyond kind of just like, but I, but I, yeah, I think that uh, the music thing, it's gonna, I mean, it, especially in the, in the context of capitalism, there's gonna be like this kind of like implementation of the automated art making that AI is capable of. Mm -hmm. But I think that there'll never be, I mean, I, I'll just, point back to this beautiful instrument because I think there's something about like making music that comes from the breath mm -hmm. and the, the, the this this kind of zone yeah the gut zone this is the dis this is a the real discovery zone, zone. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. yeah and uh I think that there's something about that that um is sort of a, a scream that comes from that that primal that fundamental self-world distinction that mm. uh that's that's what I that's what I grasp yeah tightly to yeah, in my life. yeah. I want to bring up a point you were talking about earlier in the sense of AI acting as mirrors. Um, you were talking about how there are forms of technology that do act like mirrors, and then there's also forms of technology that act like crystal balls. And the differentiation being that the mirrors is something that's presently reflected, but crystal balls is something that projects into the future. I was... I, I, that I've been talking about, honestly, I did my research on you a couple of days ago and I've been having many discussions with my friends about it because uh, we've all been kind of in this pocket of realizing how the world itself and the synchronicities of the universe are very reflective. Um, I was wondering in your personal life beyond music, if you've, I'm, I'm, I could almost be certain that you've encountered a lot of people that have reflected parts of you or stories of you that have helped you understand yourself better, but have you ran into people in your life that have served as almost premonitions for what your future would soon look like? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I mean, yeah, to go back to that first sort of like mirror concept that Dave's talking about and that you brought up again, I think essentially what we fear in AI and taking over our jobs and our lives and our musical careers and all that stuff is like this projected fear onto something that we ourselves have created. And that is, you know, that's a mirror that we're looking at, that we're fearing. And it's not really something external. It's just an extension of us, like you said. And so I think, yeah, in life, we encounter all these kind of almost, yeah, uh, uncanny synchronicities. You know, once you hear about something, you start seeing it everywhere. And is that, like, related to the fact that it has just appeared or that you're just now aware of it and sort of, like, crops up everywhere? And there is this sort of sense that everything is constantly adjusting. And that's the, the kind of the, those days when I feel like I'm, like, I'm seeing all this stuff for the first time. I'm like, oh, is this a simulation? Like, is this curated yeah. content just for me in yeah. my sort of curated um, content life, you know, because we're all the main characters in our little movie um, series content 
uh, production studios. Um, but yeah, I think I have experienced something like that, like a, like a premonition or something. But I think it's like, you know, your life is like a narrative when you think about your past and memory and all that stuff. It's so, so soft and malleable and it's mm. always changing. Your kind of perception of yourself in the past changes based on how you are in the present. And that, in that way, the past is even kind of constantly morphing and changing right. and the future as well. So when you encounter a person in your life and you feel like something is kind of shifting, Maybe you don't notice it at the time, but maybe a few years down the line, you look back on that thing and you connect the dots in this sort of narrative, almost like conspiracy theory way in your own life where mm. you're like, oh, all these pieces fit together. But maybe that's just also a projection of sort of yeah. your own narrative of your life and how you want it to sort of line up. Whereas someone else could kind of write the story of your life and have a totally different kind of plot point. Um, but yeah, like that was this, this, this piece that I wrote called Cybernetica that I actually co-wrote with Dave. That was a really interesting process because what I did was I I had a, an organization collect all of my data mm. and then I made a sort of piece based on that. And was we, that the We Dream piece? That was, this is called Cybernetica. It was like a commissioned work that I did and Dave um, was the one true observer. He was sort of the voice of this product that I had to find my way out of and I couldn't find my way out until mm. I used it. And, and it was actually the there was a cool, from Cybernetica, I feel like the, your, the process of you getting all your data collection from throughout your life, like retroactively and then yeah. showing it to you, there was kind of a way that it shows how like a mirror and a crystal ball have some overlap because a mirror shows you what already is in the way that like, you know, AI, we look at AI and it shows us all our biases and it reveals a lot of things that mm. exist in like this kind of like social system. But then in doing that, it changes the future. Exactly. And you can kind of respond to the, your, to the reflection by trying to change the reflection or you can see that reflection and be like, okay, that's what we are. Let's keep being that mm. in a kind of more mechanical way. Right. And mm -hmm. I guess with, with you and like getting your life, the information from your from your entire life up to that point kind of like reflected back to you through this data collection process, it changed It changed your future. It showed what possibilities are there kind of in this weird symmetry with what you now knew more about your past. 100%. And, it yeah. did. It, did, it did, did change the course of my life. And that was a sort of concept in this meta way of the show that I couldn't do what I was doing or figure out what I was doing unless I was doing it. There mm, was no theorizing right. or sort of rule. It was like this product, like what is this product? Sort of like an existential, like what is this reality or whatever we're in. We can't really figure that out or do it without doing it, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. So I feel like while we were doing this process of writing it, I was like, we can't write it unless we're actually writing it. Like I couldn't conceive of what it would be until we were actually doing it and yeah. that was the story so yeah. yeah it was a pretty tripped out process yeah and that's what's cool about music is because whether we're tr trying to understand rewrite or co-write the past and the future music is a way to just time capsule freeze and at least give everyone a three minute breath to exist presently which you're doing so well at uh you're doing well at that. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. We were a little bit I was a little bit nervous. I don't know about Dave. Dave's never nervous. <laughs> nah y'all are killing it. And uh, maybe we can get into a little more music and we'll Get back talk. into the music zone? Okay. Yeah, music zone, post, big brain zone. Sounds good. Enter discovery zone. Okay. Hell yeah. Let's keep it going.
the arpeggio on that is just phenomenal. And that sax tone is perfect. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Yo, thank you, Discovery Zone, for being here. I, you've given me much to ponder upon. I still have like half of my page that we will discuss uh, at a later date. To, to ponder upon. Yes, upon once to with, what's, where, when, where, why. How? Uh, In the green room over <laughs> oh my god, right, 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 right. Uh, thank you to our crew for getting this done. We love you so much, like, literally. And thank you all so much for watching. We also could not do this without you. By the time you are watching this on YouTube, it is on all streaming services, okay? So don't worry about it. I know you just watched this and you're like, no, but I'm about to go grocery shopping, but I can't be looking at my phone and getting cat food. Well, guess what? You don't even have to worry. You can just listen on the go. Apple, Spotify, Tidal, you name it, we're there. Tap in. And until next time, I'm Fingy. Have a good one. Peace. <laughs>